Well, good afternoon. It's uh, certainly a pleasure to be here. I've been in Germany a few times before, but this is my first occasion in Berlin, uh, a beautiful city. And from what I've heard, it does seem that you are rather far ahead of us in the United States in terms of vegetarian nutrition, which is uh, uh, nice to hear. Um, before I start, you'll see that I have a few slides that it has a preliminary not for citation. That means it's not published yet, and uh, we'd prefer, in fact, it uh, should not be published by anyone else, uh, of course. Um, now, how do I advance this? There we go. So I'm going to talk to you today, I'm an epidemiologist, and I'm going to talk to you today mainly about evidence from the Adventist Health Study, and I've called this the vegetarian advantage. I have an assistant who I asked to liven up my slides. She got very excited on this one, as you can see, and uh, has all kinds of interesting uh, things to say. Um, so you might say, uh, seeing I'm going to talk about evidence mainly from the Adventist Health Study, what is it about Adventists? Why should we study Adventists? Uh, so just a word or two about that. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists are a fairly well-known religion, particularly in the United States. Uh, they're a Protestant denomination and are a little bit unusual because they uh, promote as a religious virtue the idea of healthy living. And in particular, it is recommended that Adventists are vegetarian, not vegan particularly, but some kind of vegetarian, but it is not required. So it means we end up with about half of them being vegetarian and half of them not, which you can imagine from the point of view of an epidemiologist is a wonderful opportunity to study the effects of the vegetarian Adventists as compared to the non-vegetarian Adventists, people who are similar in many ways. Uh, they're all religious people, of course, and you might be a little bit surprised on, by reading the papers recently that Americans tend to be quite religious people, uh, more so, I think, on average than uh, the Europeans. So Adventists are not so unusual, uh, particularly in the United States. So some of the themes that I wanted to talk about today was to make the point that the vegan diet is very different from other diets and of course this is American data, uh, to make some comment how maybe the importance of duration of diet, how long you've been a vegetarian might be important, and what is it that keeps people vegetarianism or makes them or motivates them to become vegetarian as compared to slipping back, as is actually so common in people who decide to become vegetarian, they don't always stick at it. Um, I'm also going to suggest that the current definitions of vegetarianism are inadequate for research purposes and make some suggestion perhaps uh, for some uh, popular definition. I'm not a nutritionist, I'm uh, an epidemiologist, so keep that in mind. But I'm, most of the time I'm going to be talking about the possible health benefits of vegetarianism and uh, make the point, as you'll notice, that not all of uh, the benefits come from just the absence of animal products, but probably also from the extra plant foods, as you've heard so eloquently from uh, Professor Leitzman a few minutes ago. So a little bit, first of all, about this cohort study that I'm going to be largely describing the results, some of the results to you. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, we had a questionnaire uh, all of these people were Seventh-day Adventists. They lived all across the United States, and you can see the numbers in different parts of the country, nearly 4,000 in Canada. So it was a very diverse group. Apart from the fact that they were all Adventists, in fact, there were all walks of life, uh, a large variety of ages, as you'll see. And uh, our primary goals were to associate vegetarian dietary habits with three of the most common cancers, breast, prostate, and colon, although we will look at others. And then to think a little bit more about, <coughs> excuse me, what are the components of a vegetarian diet that might be most important? Uh, because it really adds to the causal power, the causal thinking, if you can not only show that there's a difference, but then start to think about why that might be. Our cohort had about 96,000 people. Uh, about 25,000 of them were black, uh, 
<coughs> and uh, only a small number were Hispanic and Asian. 65% were female, which largely corresponds to the church demographics. And on average, at age, uh, they were 60 years, the white, and 56 years, the black subjects. We began by, first of all, dividing them to different kinds of dietary pattern. Excuse me. We uh, had about four different kinds of vegetarian, as you can see here. And uh, first of all, there were the vegans, who ate none of the animal products, of course. The lactose, who were able to eat dairy and eggs. And the pescos, who, <coughs> excuse me, in addition were allowed fish. The semi-vegetarians, who had these flesh foods, but only less than once a week. And then the non-vegetarians. And you can see in total that we had about 42,000 who were non-vegetarians, nearly half, and the, much of the others were lacto over vegetarians but about 9,000 who were vegan, who was about 8.5% of our population, so quite a lot of vegans. I'd like to think a little bit about the vegan diet, and these diets are very different. Let me explain this slide here. I have several that are similar. Along the 1.0, that is the non-vegetarian line. <coughs> Excuse me. And so you can see that amongst the uh, different kinds of vegetarians, the vegans are represented by green. This means that they have two and a half times as much of some food as the non-vegetarians, or would have perhaps half as much as the non-vegetarians. And you can see that the vegan, the green lines, are really quite unusual as compared to the others. And they stand out, and there's usually a progression from uh, the non-vegetarians to the semi-pesco, lacto, and on to the vegans. If we look at fruit and vegetables, <coughs> excuse me, a whole lot of different uh, fruit and vegetables here, Again, we see the same kind of situation, that the vegans look really right, rather different. If plant protein foods, no surprise, a similar kind of thing. Animal protein foods, exactly the opposite. So vegan diets really are quite dramatically different to, to others. It may be important how long people have been in their present dietary pattern and you can see here that uh, in our population, <coughs> at least, that the pescos and the vegans have been that way for about 20 years on average. And the lactos and the non-vegetarians tend to have been that way for much of their life, in fact. So these are rather long-lived in their present patterns. We find that as people get older and <clears throat> this is a longitudinal analysis of the same people, <coughs> excuse me, that the um, frequency of, or, or the, there's a tendency as they get older to become less and less non-vegetarian. And this is balanced by, you can see here that the blue in the background, more pescos, more vegans. So it turns out that the non-vegetarians tend to become lacto-over-vegetarians as they get older, and the lacto-over-vegetarians tend to become vegans as they get older in this population. Well, what might it be in the Adventist population that supports such a counter-cultural kind of situation, people living differently in the way they eat? Well, there is social support and social pressure from the group, uh, family support, and in many cases, entrenched habits and familiarity with these diets since their childhood. And then the skills that are taught in terms of cooking and so forth. So one question is, <coughs> can these be transported to other settings? And the answer, I think, is yes, at least in part. Uh, work settings, other church settings, uh, clubs and schools. And sometimes uh, a little help, a little advice from a health professional is a good thing. It says, uh, 
Yes, I do feel a bypass is in order. Bypass the refrigerator, the cupboard, and bypass the pizza parlor. And so I, I think the, I'm sure that many of you here are health professionals, and that does go a long way. Although I must say, when I look at the slide, I usually think the doctor would do well to take more of his own advice. But uh, um, I think that the definition of a vegetarian is actually, from a research perspective, inadequate. And in fact, there are a number of professional societies, as was mentioned before, that will not um, describe vegetarianism as a bona fide diet and make recommendations about it, largely because they think that it lacks specificity. And I think to some extent they're right. Because you can see here that we usually think of a vegetarian as uh, adhering to the absence of flesh meats, or maybe the absence of all animal products. And that's a very simple definition, and that simplicity is great. And the fact that you are all here today and finding it very useful shows that it's helpful for many people. But the big problem is that there's no guidance for the rest of the diet apart from the animal products. And we can see here that all of these foods are vegetarian. And uh, there's some of them on the left side are healthy. And there's others that I think we would mainly agree are less than healthy. And then there's other kinds of foods entirely that, for instance, Indians might use. And yet they're all considered vegetarian. Uh, some of the Indian foods have a large admixture of ghee, which is kind of a uh, dairy and buttery product. Many of them are cooked very long and somewhat severely, and we don't know um, whether they're healthful or not. I don't think. Here's some data from our study, which is quite interesting. We, conduct, uh, we um, put together, constructed a simple score of a healthy diet, and it was really too simple, but nevertheless, it proved to be quite predictive. We simply gave foods, about 45 different foods, a plus one if they were generally thought to be healthy, a minus one if they were thought not to be healthy, and a zero if they were thought to be kind of neutral, just looking at the literature. And then we gave everyone a score, just in that simple way, by adding up all those foods. And it turned out to be really quite predictive. You can see that those that got a low score, they had many, some more minuses, foods, they had a higher mortality rate, whereas those that had the higher scores really did much better, and this is highly statistically significant. You notice that whatever the score was, interestingly, the vegetarians tended to do uh, a little bit better. Their mortality was less, the lower bar there. But do you also notice, and this is really the point I'm making, that the difference between people who are vegetarian all along here is about a 40% difference in risk. So it makes the point that in terms of total mortality, um, there are good vegetarians and not so good vegetarian diets. And this is something we need to think about carefully. And uh, that in part is why I think we need to think about something maybe that we could call a healthy vegetarian diet. And it could be defined in very simple ways uh, not for research purposes, perhaps, but, you know, what are the don'ts? No meats, we're not so clear about fish, perhaps. Uh, dairy and eggs, optionally none, but other just otherwise just small amounts. Uh, avoid sodas, fruits, uh, heavy in, in heavy syrup. Avoid heavily processed plant foods, as we've just heard about, and solid fats. And maybe only occasionally, maybe once a week or less, cakes and pies, Pies, uh, pies and candy and so forth. Uh, and then you could have some do's. Load up the plate with vegetables, salads, nuts and legumes. Two to three servings of fruit per day, being careful, the cal calories can add up. Uh, have them natural, raw, or in some cases cooked, is best for the vegetables or fruit, whole grains. Variety is good, with interesting combinations. Uh, fry by wiping the pan with a vegetable oil. Ensure that there's adequate protein from combinations of whole grains and legumes and nuts. And the vegans and those who substantially reduce eggs and dairy must supplement with B12.
So I think it would be good if we could come with, up with a definition that maintained the basic simplicity of what we would define as a vegetarian diet, but went into a little bit more detail in some of these ways. So now I want to turn to the health benefits and uh, uh, the kind of things that I get interested in as an epidemiologist that uh, I believe are enjoyed by vegetarians. In talking about, first of all, risk factors, and then mortality and life expectancy, and then finally some disease events, cardiovascular disease, and some cancers. And this is all data from Adventist Health Study 2, so it's one perspective. But uh, Adventist Health Study 2 is probably the largest study available of vegetarians, but nevertheless it's only one study, and we must be, we keep that in mind. So risk factors. And we were able to divide our people, as I said, into different kinds of vegetarians and then the non-vegetarian reference group. And you can see on the left, for average height females, it's kind of like a stepladder. <coughs> that when you look at their body weight, uh, up and up it goes. And the vegans are certainly much lighter than others for the same height. And for the men, it's exactly the same thing. And this is uh, in the blacks. The previous one was in white subjects. And the same kind of progression, although the magnitude of the differences are a little less. So body weight is very, very different. When it comes to hypertension, self-reported, uh, doctor-diagnosed hypertension, the prevalence, this is in non-black subjects. And again, you can see that same or sim similar progression of uh, from vegans up through non-vegetarians, with uh, the non-vegetarians getting a score of one, the vegans having less than 30% of the self-reported but doctor-diagnosed hypertension. If we then went out and measured blood pressure in a sample of these subjects, and these are whites, we have similar data in blacks, with similar results, and defined blood pressure as more than 140 over 90 or currently taking hypertensive medicines, again, we see the great advantage of being vegans or lacto-over-vegetarians, particularly. Uh, if we turn now to diabetes, another common risk factor for cardiovascular disease and a, a number of other uh, diseases. Uh, again, this is self-reported diabetes, uh, and this is prevalent diabetes, but they're on medicines that it's doctor-diagnosed, and uh, you can see, again, there's a three-fold, at least, difference in risk. If we look at the incidence of diabetes, so these are people that were new diabetics after our study began. And perhaps not the progression is not quite so striking, but it's there. And these differences are highly statistically significant. High blood cholesterol, self-reported, doctor diagnosed and treated, same kind of thing. It kind of gets boring after a while, doesn't it? Um, the mean C-reactive protein, which is a measure of inflammation, uh, again, the vegans are uh, having levels that are about half of those of the non-vegetarians and the others in between, and these, as you can see, are very highly statistically significant up here. They're not likely to be due to chance. If we look at mean fasting insulin, I could have shown you a similar slide for fasting glucose. Uh, again, we see exactly that same progression. And uh, these, all the vegetarian categories, the three to the left, are significantly different from the non-vegetarians on the right. So in risk factors, big advantages on almost every risk factor that you can think of. You'd expect maybe, having called those risk factors, that this would translate to some differences in life expectancy and mortality. And in all that follows, I want you to notice one particular thing that our non-vegetarians, and they're our comparison group for the vegetarians all the time, are actually very low meat, or relatively low meat. On average, our non-vegetarians consume only about 49 grams of meat per day. And that's about 13 grams of red meat, 18 of poultry, and 18 of fish. So our comparison group, we're, we're asking a fairly hard comparison, really, it's between vegetarians and low meat non-vegetarians. So bear that in mind in everything that follows.
And I'm sorry, the next three slides are kind of busy. I hope I can guide you through them. But uh, if we focus up here where the red bar is, that you can see that we're comparing vegetarians and non-vegetarians with respect this time to total mortality. And there's about a 12% advantage overall, uh, this being a little higher in men and uh, not so pronounced in women, but with uh, moderate size confidence intervals. And then we look at the different causes, and you can see that kind of split out there, and it follows across in different ways. Um, we have about twice as many deaths now as when the slide was made and published, so uh, we, we need to analyze it again and have uh, smaller confidence intervals. Uh, now we say, we ask, uh, it always comes up, well, it's one thing to be a vegetarian, but you should be a lacto, or should you be a vegan, or what's the evidence for and against? And here we see that for what it's worth, when we look at all-cause mortality, the vegans and the pescos look like they're doing better, but uh, marginal statistical significance when you split it out because our numbers get smaller. And really, at this point in time, all we can say is that the vegetarians as a group are doing better than the non-vegetarians. Very little question about that. But within the vegetarian group, we can't for sure say that one is better than the other. As time goes on and we get uh, more deaths accrue, hopefully we'll be able to talk some, some more about that. Um, you'll notice out here in the other category that the vegans are doing well and the pescos. And it turns out when you look at that in more detail, it seems to be mainly deaths from uh, diabetes and from kidney disease, which is probably related in turn to diabetes and hypertension in a major way that re is represented there largely in the, that other category. Paper that we published a number of years ago compared carefully uh, all Adventists to a concurrent study that was going on out of Stanford University, and all of these people came from California at that time, and we used exactly the same definition of the coronary heart disease events. And this slide looks at first definite fatal CHD and first definite myocardial infarction. And you can see that if you look at um, the, oops, the men and the women, that if we look at all the Adventists, that they're about uh, half the rate of the non-Adventist group and the uh, Stanford uh, population who got a score of 1.0, and for definite myocardial infarction, uh, really quite similar. But notice if we look then at the vegetarian Adventists, that uh, those numbers uh, on average got much smaller yet as compared to the Stanford study non-vegetarians. So this is some pretty good evidence that things are much different for coronary heart disease amongst the Adventist group and amongst the vegetarian Adventists in particular. I now want to turn to some of the common cancers in vegetarians. And these are our results to date, a number of them not published yet. And this information is a little bit controversial. And uh, let me just say here, that different studies of vegetarians, and I guess the main studies have actually been um, our work in the US, uh, also in the United Kingdom over a number of decades, and you'll hear a little later from Dr. Key in regard to that, and also um, 20 or 30 years ago, some good work that was done right here in Germany, in a smaller study of vegetarians. And the results don't always um, kind of concur with each other, particularly when it comes to cancer and uh, to some extent an all-cause mortality, which is kind of interesting. And I think we have to consider the possibility that vegetarians, even in different parts of the, veget of the Western world, are actually different on average, that British vegetarians are not really eating the same, for instance, as German or American vegetarians. And we saw that the definition before was really kind of agnostic in terms of what one did with things that were not animal products. And I think there is some evidence that I won't go into today that that is likely to be the case, uh, even within the Western world. And therefore, we may not expect all the answers to be exactly the same, uh, even uh, comparing Europe to uh, the United States, for instance. Well, here's some data that is um, 
not yet published actually, where we have just been able to compare the results from our study to the results of a census population in the United States. And you can see there that uh, looking at all cancers, for instance, and this is not mortality, this is incidence, um, that the Adventists appear to have about a 30% reduction. If we look at all-cause mortality, the Adventists have about a 32% reduction, which uh, you might say, well, that's uh, interesting. Uh, we found that the vegetarian Adventists only had about a 12% reduction in mortality compared to the non-vegetarian Adventists. But remember, the non-vegetarian Adventists were kind of low meat, so if you put the whole Adventist group together, it looks like there's an advantage for mortality in excess of 30%. Um, and if you look at these different cancers here, by and large, these red spots hang well below that 1.0 line, which represents the results in the American census population. Uh, one possible standout is prostate cancer. Uh, we also wondered, because the Adventist population inevitably was a volunteer population, whether there could have been some healthy volunteer effect that people that were already feeling sick didn't sign up. And so we actually excluded the first couple of years of follow-up, and really these statistics didn't change at all, which is not entirely surprising, because for cancer, you don't get much lead time warning. Before you've got it, you are really often usually uh, not sick, actually. So you wouldn't have much uh, cause to not sign up because, to the study because you felt sick if you were going to get cancer in six months. You wouldn't know. For all-cause mortality, that may not be so true. But even so, when we took that step of uh, cutting out the first couple of years, things really didn't change. Um, in, the, in the US, the African-Americans have a uh, significantly higher mortality experience and higher mor mortality, particularly from, from cancers, than other Americans. And so we were interested to look at our 25,000 subjects who were uh, black. And uh, again, we found about a 38% reduction in all-cause mortality, this time compared to black census population. So the Adventist blacks were doing better than the non-Adventist blacks. And looking at the cancers, not so clearly uh, less than the census population, but of course the numbers of events were much lower and so our confidence intervals are wider and we need to wait for a little bit more time to pass. So thinking about a particular cancer now, colorectal cancer, let's see what we can find. And uh, this work is uh, published, maybe some of you have seen it, but if we put all the vegetarians together and look at the probability of surviving to a given age without having received a diagnosis of colorectal cancer, we find that in a survival curve that the vegetarian Adventists hang significantly below the, I'm sorry, they, they above, they are surviving better free of colorectal cancer than the non-vegetarian Adventists. And uh, this is a highly significant difference between the two. And uh, the magnitude of that difference at a particular age is about 20%. At a particular age, there's about a 20% lower risk in our vegetarian population. And remember, these were mainly lacto-ovo vegetarian, but I haven't showed you. Our lacto-ovos tend to have an intake of eggs and dairy, about half of that of our non-vegetarians. So even our lacto-ovos are low dairy and low eggs. Uh, but it's a mix of these two, and what I'm showing you here, uh, that accounts for that 20% uh, reduction. And the basic and the full models are just putting in different covariates, uh, but really things don't change. So the question always comes up, well, is it, uh, uh, are the vegans doing particularly well, or is it the pescos or the lactose? And when we split it out, again, we find that we're in the same situation as for total mortality, put all the vegetarians together, and uh, there's no question that there's a difference. But amongst the different patterns, it's not clear. The PESCOs look like they're doing particularly well here, but actually they're not significantly different from the other two. Um, but it is interesting to, to notice that. And notice also that the vegans are kind of nothing special when it comes to colorectal cancer. And we'll come back to that point. 
Well, people, you know, despite the fact of what we wrote in the paper that the pesco vegetarians were not significantly different, of course, the, the, the news people didn't uh, take that perspective and came up with vegetables and fish are key to lowering coal, coal and cancer risk, which is not what we said about the fish. And uh, it's interesting, we haven't published it yet, but it looks like the pesco situation is particularly complicated, and I'm not going to go into details here but it looks pretty clear that the advantage they have is not due to the fish. Because if we just put in a indicator variable in the regression model for PESCOs, but then model fish independently, we find that fish actually has a strong and significant positive relationship with colorectal cancer, which is not a finding that others have found. That they possibly haven't been able to split out the different meats in quite the same way as we have. I don't know the answer to this, but I think it's um, certainly going to be complicated. And what the news articles suggested, that fish might be uh, one of the keys to preventing colon cancer, might be 100% uh, wrong. And uh, we'll have to see what we come up with there. Well, I think it's always useful to think about uh, what could be explaining these things. So we find that the vegetarians are doing better. It's going to make it much more uh, likely to be causal and to be much more convincing if we can come up with some reasons as to why that should be. Are there particular nutrients or foods that make sense? Because vegetarians eat a lot of them and they also may give some indication of being protective or hazardous, as the case may be. Well, of course, processed red meat is something that everybody knows is related to uh, colorectal cancer. And we just did analysis recently in our data. We don't have a huge number of people that eat a lot of processed red meat. I think probably up here at the 30, 35 to 50 grams a day, we've probably only got a few thousand, about 96,000 that do that. But interestingly, when we plot out risk and adjusting for a whole host of other dietary and non-dietary factors, we find that this is the line that we see here in our data. And the recent announcement from IARC and WHO, you might remember, that uh, had a lot of press in the US, maybe over here, suggested that 50 grams a day was associated with an 18% increase in risk of colorectal cancer. I don't know how that was uh, interpreted over here, but usually on the news back in the States, uh, they reported it, but then said, well, you know, it doesn't really matter very much, uh, an 18% risk, and if you only have uh, a little less than the 50 per day, 50 grams per day, uh, who really cares about that? And uh, so it's interesting, at least in our data, that the picture really looks totally different. At uh, 50 grams per day, if we were to extrapolate it out, we're at about a 80%, 80% difference in risk, not 18. And we see we hit the 18% risk uh, so early on that it's perhaps unbelievable. Maybe this curve, the mathematical form, should be a little flatter. But even so, there's no question that when we get a way out here, and in fact, uh, if we do a one-sided confidence uh, or statistical test, our results are statistically significantly different from uh, the reports that came from the meta-analysis. And you might say, well, one study is compared to many studies, and that's a fair comment. But remember that when many studies are put together with different questionnaires and so forth, that sometimes the uh, errors that are involved in that kind of compound in that way. So there is a tendency for things to be... Uh, uh, to be uh, trending towards the null and to be biased towards the null. And we have that uh, problem in our study as well, but probably a little less than uh, in many studies put together. I want to turn now just very quickly, and I'll pass over this, to the question of dairy and calcium and colorectal cancer, which is an interesting one. And uh, we have the ability to look at dairy in a way that few other studies can because we have so many people that have zero dairy or very, very low dairy, and then a bunch that have really pretty normal dairy because our non-vegetarians are eating really as much dairy as anyone else in the United States, at least. So what do we find? And if we look here, and this is kind of complex, isn't it? But this is splitting to colon cancer and rectal cancer and then the combination. 
And we're comparing here extreme quintiles, and this is total dairy here in kcals per day. So we're comparing about 61 kcals to 301, and you can see that put them all together, and uh, maybe a suggestion of a decreased risk, not significant. If we look at colon cancer by itself, really nothing much going on, moderately wide confidence intervals. Look at rectal cancer. That's where most of the signal in our data is coming from with regard to dairy, and uh, fairly wide confidence intervals, but actually highly statistically significant. If we split it out to dairy protein, dairy fat, dairy carbohydrate, we get mainly the same kind of picture with the rectal, the dairy uh, nutrients, which are really probably, they're highly correlated with each other and just markers for total dairy, I suspect. Um, now, there's one that I skipped here, and I don't really want to dwell on it. This is a regression calibration where we do a measurement error adjustment that uh, gives us supposedly a less biased result, but uh, less precise. So the confidence intervals widen here, and weird things happen, uh, 1.63, but nowhere near significant. But for rectal cancer, um, it is a much stronger estimate and still retains statistical significance and probably is a less biased but less precise answer when we do that. We're regressing onto repeated 24-hour recalls when we do that. <clears throat> when we turn the page and look at calcium, and by the way, I should have mentioned that we adjusted for calcium in the previous slide, so it was dairy independent of the calcium and dairy in the previous slide, and we still found an effect. Here, we adjust for dairy. So this is calcium. It's really non-dairy calcium. And you can see here that uh, we're not finding anything much going on for rectal cancer, the regression calibration, very wide confidence intervals, so nothing much to say about that. But we're finding an indication of perhaps an advantage for colon cancer. And for the regression calibration, um, it's 0 0.75, uh, no, I'm not, it's 0 0.47, and that is statistically significant. Um, so it's kind of interesting in our data, we find that when we look at the dairy and the calcium independently, we seem to find an independent effect of dairy on rectal cancer, but an independent effect of calcium on colon cancer. However, Having said that, the confidence intervals of the alternate cancer in each of those are wide enough that we could not by any means rule out um, a modest effect, even though we don't find it as significant. So, you know, a non-significant effect is not a negative effect. You hardly ever prove the null hypothesis, so remember that. Uh, when you find a significant effect, then you are kind of disproving the null hypothesis and saying that something is going on. But when you don't find a significant effect, the best you can say is that it's undeterminant rather than that it's negative in, in, in most cases. So, in summary for colorectal cancer, we find that processed meats, as confirmed here, uh, probably in our data have a much stronger effect uh, and could be an important reason for the vegetarian advantage. The vegans may do a little less well, as dairy and calcium may be protective, though in different ways. And uh, I've already mentioned that uh, these were independent effects. So the risk of prostate cancer is what I wanted to move on to next from colorectal. And I'm just going to do the prostate and then the breast, and then we'll wrap up. And uh, so... Let's go through this. We have about 1,100 prostate cancers. We divide it out to aggressive and advanced cases, and we have about 244. And what I want to show you here, just very quickly as we go by, is that looking at the overall here, and these are different models, let's sort of focus on this one, which is the most complete. What we find is that the vegans have an advantage. This is published whereas the other vegetarian categories have no advantage as compared to the non-vegetarians. In the advanced, we find it's not significant, the numbers are very small, but again, there is a suggestion that again, the vegans are doing better for this cancer. I think I'll pass over that. We also find that 
um, digging down now into perhaps some of the components of diet, going from dietary patterns, that tomatoes, as others have previously found, may be important, but we find an interesting difference. If you look here, the raw tomatoes really didn't, uh, when we compared extreme quintiles of intake, didn't show much evidence of effect. But the cooked tomatoes, that's where we found uh, something appeared to be going on with a uh, positive p-value. And this is adjusted for a bunch of other factors that seem to be important in prostate cancer. When we looked at the aggressive prostate cancers, again, we found that it was the cooked tomatoes and uh, that seemed to be more important, cooked or canned. And the black subjects, not so impressive, but uh, somewhat similar story. And so there's a number of potential mechanisms of lycopene, and I think uh, Professor Leitzman probably went over some of these, and I won't dwell on that, except to say that there's some evidence of a greater bioavailability of lycopene in the cooked tomatoes as they tend to assume the cis rather than the trans form. We also looked at alpha linolenic acid, an omega-3 acid, and this is just to show that in our population we have a rather high intake on average of linolenic acid. And when we looked at it in relation to prostate cancer, we did actually find a uh, significant protective association, again adjusting for all these other things, and that was true in the black subjects as well. You may know that blacks have about twice the risk of prostate cancer as others. So uh, then we looked also at uh, calcium and dairy because there's some evidence that uh, that might be a problem, there might be hazard with that. When we looked here at calcium running down that hazard ratio column, you can see that we really didn't find a strong signal there. But when we turned to dairy, and I apologize, this is now running the other way, if we look at all cancers here, um, that we find a very strong signal, positive signal for dairy, highly significant, and uh, that was true more or less across the board, perhaps more impressively so in the non-advanced than the advanced cancer. So we found the vegans did better for prostate cancer, and perhaps a partial explanation would be the alpha-linolenic acid that vegans uh, eat more of, flaxseed and so forth, the cooked tomatoes associated, and also the absence of dairy. So we have some partial explanation for that. And finally, just a, a slide or two on breast cancer, and this just was published recently, where again, if we looked at the total vegetarians, we saw no hint of an effect down here. 0.97 as compared to the vegetarians, that should be a 1.0. Um, here's with BMI included. But what we found is perhaps a hint of a relationship, the p-value is not significant amongst the vegans. And we noticed that amongst the vegans, we had only 51 breast cancer cases. So we were struggling with relatively low numbers when we come to this particular group. But it's kind of interesting when you look at the survival curve free of breast cancer. And here is the non-vegetarians in red and the pescos and the lactose. And look how the vegans kind of stand out. But that wasn't quite statistically significant, which is uh, interesting. So we need to keep following that group. So let me uh, give an overall summary here. Um, first of all, the vegans in HS2, at least, are very different from non-vegetarians and even from other vegetarians. I think the current definitions of vegetarianism should be improved and uh, made a few suggestions. I'm not a nutritionist, it's probably not my task to do that. The health benefits of vegetarianism are very real, and uh, we find some consistency between risk factors and disease and mortality experience. We found risk factors, lower body weight, lower blood pressure, diabetes, lipids, insulin glucose, CRP. Uh, we find a hint of lower IGF-1. Dr. Key in Britain has found that in the vegans. Uh, Turning to disease events in the blue, we find less cancer by about 10%, and it um, undoubtedly differs by cancer site across all Adventists, including the low meat non-vegetarians, 30% less, 
is colorectal cancer in the vegetarians compared to non-vegetarian Adventists by 20%. Vegans have less prostate cancer compared to non-vegetarian Adventists by 35%, and some reasons for that. Vegans possibly have less breast cancer. We need to look harder. Other cancers we haven't looked at yet. We intend to do so. They're lower numbers, less power, but still are going to be worth a careful look. Less heart attack and fatal heart disease by about 50%, and lower mortality and greater longevity by about three years. I didn't show you that, but that's what our stats indicate. Notice that the health benefits are due not only to the reductions in animal products, but also to the increased plant foods. They may be complex. Dairy is associated with decreased, uh, sorry, with a, yes, decreased colorectal cancer, but increased prostate cancer. How do you deal with that? Maybe something to do with family history or other risk factors. The possible importance of duration of dietary effects that I didn't really go into. And then we need to think about forces that can promote vegetarian diets and help prevent recidivism. There's a quote that I like actually put in the, uh, inside uh, a book that I published uh, uh, a few years ago. It comes from William C. Roberts, the editor of the American Journal of Cardiology way back in 1999. It says, if the money we use to purchase and eat the muscles of cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, and fish were put into vegetables, fruits, and lipid-lowering drugs, our health would skyrocket. Ask the animals about the slaughter. The cows, 100,000 killed a day. Pigs, 250,000. Chickens, 15 million a day. Can you imagine that? The healthier are our non-human animals, the healthier are the human ones. We kill them, and then they kill us. That's a pretty interesting quote, isn't it? Um, now, some may also suggest that there are certain risks of eating vegetables. Tit for tat, I suppose. He was a vegetarian. <laughs> So if you're a vegetarian, uh, congratulations. If you're not, well, at least you're here. That must mean something. Uh, and in conclusion, vegetarianism provides obvious benefits to the planet and also our animal friends. Adding this to what we know about its health advantages, and I think it just makes good sense. Thank you. Mm.